All right, everybody, welcome back. We are going to be continuing with our example of the cockroach. So last time we talked specifically about the utility of the, me of the uh, mechanisms that cockroaches have evolved to have um, regarding uh, predator or, um, or danger evasion. And secondly, we talked about um, the mechanism itself and the and the creation of basically this um, um, and the evolution of this uh, nerve complex, um, complex nerve complex. <laughs> and um, and thirdly, we talked a little bit about the development of um, of this. Uh, system. So we know that this is not something that is created um, as the cockroach ages, for example, or it's, it's something that is learned. We know that both um, juvenile and adult cockroaches um, exhibit this behavior. So now that we sort of know um, and are able to frame uh, the, the behavior in, in those terms, we can start to think about how uh, this complex might be related to um, a larger evolutionary tree. So another arthropod um, that has a very similar um, biology is crayfish. So you can see that on the tail here, they have these little hair-like appendages much like we saw in the cockroach. And we see that it too has this complex uh, nerve structure that goes up um, to the brain. Um, and ultimately it's able to get information from, again, these hairs um, and is able to um, have automatic re reflux re uh, reflexes um, based on this nerve structure. So from this, we can start to build a larger evolutionary hypothesis um, where we can say, okay, so both of these creatures have this um, very similar uh, nerve structure. It's quite possible that they perhaps have a shared common ancestor that has a similar trait. Alternatively, um, and what we've just sort of talked about before is, you know, these, these uh, two creatures could have um, independently uh, came up with the same solution, if you will. Um, uh, and um, ultimately, um, individuals with this trait evolved, uh, with this traits were selected um, and had preferential survival, were able to um, leave this structure on to their offspring or pass this structure on to their offspring. So this could be an example of convergent evolution, or it could be an example of a shared common ancestor. So again, this is a way that we can start to link evolution and uh, animal behavior. And ultimately, that's um, how uh, behavioral ecologists um, tend to frame their questions. Um, and these, uh, the, these are uh, four very famous um, questions that were posed by um, Dr. Timbergen, um, and they're known as Timbergen's questions. So the first is understanding the mechanism. So what is the cause of the behavior? And so in the case of the crayfish or the cockroach, that would be uh, that complex uh, nerve network. Next is a concept called ontogeny. I always pronounce that incorrectly. I always want to go onotogeny, but it's ontogeny. <laughs> um, and that's basically understanding the development of, um, of a trait or specific behavior. Um, an example of that is like understanding uh, the um, cockroach uh, both in the juvenile state and in the adult state and we see that that behavior is the same throughout them so we know that that behavior develops um, very early on in the cockroach's life. 
Next, we have to think about utility. So what is the actual utility of this behavior? Um, so this can be something um, quite complex, such as what we're seeing with the, with the um, cockroach. It's the ability to evade predators or the ability to evade um, uh, potential danger. Um, but it could also be uh, something that that is essentially vestigial or something that may have had a had a use in uh, evolutionary time but has since um, uh, developed into a new beha a, a new or um, vestigial behavior for example um, why do dogs circle or, around um, prior to lying down um, ostensibly there was a reason for that behavior um, as it's as it's well preserved um, but now it doesn't particularly serve a purpose. And this is something that we think of as uh, um, pre-adaptation. Um, another example of, um, of a trait uh, that um, is uh, pre-adaptive or co-opted is uh, when wolves um, lick each other to show submissive behavior. Well, ultimately that licking behavior um, was originally used uh, by when they were puppies to signal that they that they wanted food um, from from the mothers. So again, this is a behavior that um, used to serve a used to serve um, one purpose and now is serving a different purpose. So these are the types of questions we start to ask about when we're thinking about utility. And lastly is evolution. So how did that behavior evolve from an ancestral state? Um, and that's where we can start to link uh, crayfish with, with cockroaches. And we can start to understand how a specific behavior may have um, been selected for um, in the uh, timeline of evolution. So let's look at another example of this um, and sort of returning back to that concept of bird song. And I'm going to have you watch a, a really interesting video that sort of delves into um, the, uh, the evolution of bird song. Um, but first, for example, let's think about the mechanism. So again, this is really understanding the specific physiological and um, sometimes chemical uh, ways that a uh, behavior is being generated. So these are all the specific pathways in the brain and nervous system um, that relate to birdsong and ultimately um, produce uh, that uh, end behavior. Secondly, we have the utility. So what is the utility of birdsong? So we know that it can be used as a warning system, it can be used for social interaction, and it can be used for mating. Um, so understanding that utility, potentially observing um, these birds in their natural environment to understand how they're using that specific behavior. So next, the next question um, in uh, in this framing is the development. So when we look at birds that are reared in the wild, they have one specific bird song where they're learning some of the song from their mother. And then, however, when we have these birds that are reared in isolation, it has elements of this song. So that is indicating that there is um, specific uh, parts of the song and vocalizations that are innate. Um, however, there are still distinct differences. So we can see that, um, that there is a developmental component to the evolution of birdsong. And lastly, we can look at this larger um, tree, and this is what we sort of looked at at the beginning of the lectures um, when we're looking at Australia um, and the evolution of birdsong, and we can see that there are certain species where um, it is prevalent, where, um, and there are some species where it's not prevalent, and you, we can see where those common ancestors were and where on the evolutionary tree we were able to um, um, dif uh, different birdsong um, evolved. 
So again, when we look at all four of these um, uh, studies, we're really able to understand um, both proximal and ultimate um, type questions and, um, and really capture the broad spectrum of what is occurring uh, within a given animal behavior. So in conclusion, animal behavior is a complex study and an understanding of an animal's movement, cognition, learning, and social interactions. We can address and understand animal behavior by framing questions that address the behavior's mechanism, development, utility, and evolution. So we're able to define sort of what, a, what animal behavior is and then we're able to understand um, the specifics of that behavior through this framework of understanding the mechanism, development, utility, and evolution. Um, and these questions can be addressed with both proximal and ultimate types of questions. So the proximal might be a specific mechanism question. How, uh, how do birds create a specific vo vocalization? Uh, compared to an ultimate type of question, which is how um, does birdsong uh, develop, for example, across, across finches. And lastly, we really can understand animal behavior um, through the lens of evolutionary biology and natural selection. And ultimately, a lot of behavior that we see um, is going to um, is abiding by the laws of natural selection um, and other things and, and non-adaptive non um, evolution as well. Um, so through that lens, we can start to understand um, how behavioral ecologists start to look at animal behavior um, and ultimately connect it to uh, these larger laws that we've been talking about um, in evolution. Okay. Uh, so that concludes uh, our section. Um, good luck on studying for the exam. You guys are going to do great. Um, and we will start uh, picking up in section three. Um, so halfway, halfway through the course all. <laughs> you guys are doing great. Okay.